Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight for our seminar. I'm Gemma Farrington from Fortitude Bedford Row. I'm joined by Alison Pryor, who's also from Fortitude Bedford Row Council. And then we have Diane Robson, who's an intermediary from Triangle. I know some of you will already know her. Uh, she's kind of the star of the show, really, because she's going to give us some really interesting, she's now putting her head down, some really interesting information about the work that intermediaries do, and particularly what will help going forward if you are going to be using an intermediary. So I'm going to hand over first. Alison's going to do some background um, information, really, or some sort of, it's really about criminal proceedings and how it started. Then I'm going to do some um, talking about care proceedings and use of intermediaries in care proceedings. And then we're going to ha hand over to Diane, and then we'll have some questions at the end. So I'm going to hand over to Alison. So thank you, Gemma. Am I going to talk to you about how we came to have intermediaries in the justice system? And it's right that they first were introduced in the criminal justice system. So that's what I'm going to talk about for the first 10 minutes or so um, this evening. So um, there was a report in 1998 called Speaking Up for Justice, which made a number of recommendations aimed at improving the treatment of vulnerable and intimidated witnesses um, in the criminal justice system. And the thinking at that time was very much that there was um, a need to rebalance the system um, to address what was seen as imbalances uh, in favour of defendants and uh, against, as well, in prejudice, to prejudice uh, witnesses, and particularly prosecution witnesses and complainants. As a result of that report, um, there came into um, effect the Youth Justice and Criminal Evidence Act, which some people might be quite familiar with because it's where we now get what we call special measures in the family. Um, justice system. But that was where we first got um, those special measures for vulnerable witnesses, but crucially not for vulnerable defendants. Uh, that uh, is the act came into force in 1999, and it's section 16 that sets out those special measures. Um, section 29 of that act um, provides um, specifically for intermediaries. It says that um, a special measures direction may provide for any examination of a witness. And however and wherever conductors that provided for that uh, examination to take place remotely um, quite some time um, before we had to deal with that as a result of, of COVID. Um, to be conducted for an interpreter or other person approved by the court for the purposes of this section, and that's where we get the term intermediary. And uh, the section then sets out in a little bit more detail what the function of an intermediary is uh, to communicate to the witness questions put to the witness and to any person asking such questions um, the answers given by the witness in reply, uh, and to explain those so far as necessary to make sure they can be understood by the witness or the person in question. Uh, and witnesses um, are eligible for that direction if they're under the age of 18 at the time of the hearing, or if the court considers that the quality of evidence given by the witness is likely to be diminished uh, because they suffer from a mental disorder within the meaning of the MHA, um, or otherwise have a significant impairment of intelligence or social functioning or a physical disability or have suffered from a physical disorder. So um, after that act came into effect, and um, the first intermediaries were trained in 2003, um, that was by the Inns of Court, and they were evaluated in six pathfinder areas. Uh, that led to a recommendation that they be rolled out uh, nationally, and that was complete by September 2008. And at that point, there were about 130 registered intermediaries um, in England and Wales. Um, it was obvious, um, and indeed accepted from the start, um, that there would be defendants in the system um, who might need the assistance of an intermediary. But there was no statutory means, and in fact there, there remains no statutory uh, route to appoint them in the criminal, criminal law, or indeed to fund them. So what courts did when faced with defend the vulnerable defendants was to use their inherent powers under common law to um, direct that they be given the assistance of an intermediary. And a very early case, in fact, the earliest case I can find um, that's reported that deals with intermediaries is um, the Crown and Age, that's 2003. Uh, it's a court of appeal case. Um, there's a handout with all the citations in case anybody wants to go and look at some ancient criminal uh, law on this. But the appellant in that case had an IQ of 51. And he had the benefit of a psychological report which recommended he have the assistance of somebody whilst uh, giving his evidence. Rather ambitiously, um, counsel sought leave from the trial judge um, for the defendant to give his evidence and by pre-recorded video, which is completely um, unheard of and didn't get very far uh, in, criminal, in, in the criminal uh, system. 
Um, the judge declined that, um, but he did agree to what he called a supporter um, who could effectively act as an interpreter um, in the dock throughout the whole trial. Um, that went to appeal on a number of points. In, in the event, the Court of Appeal decided it didn't have jurisdiction to hear the appeal anyway, but it did take the opportunity um, at that stage to set out some guidance um, on cases where assistance is needed by defendants. Um, it observed that intermediaries are akin to interpreters um, and that the court was entitled to appoint them in appropriate cases using the inherent powers. Um, but it was also noted that the trial judge could and should also use his or her case management powers to ensure the fairness of proceedings. And that was an early indication of, of what was to come in terms of the appointment of defendant intermediaries. After that, there was a case of FC in the UK. That was a, a case in the European Court of Human Rights in 2005. It involved an 11-year-old um, applicant who had learning difficulties. He was convicted of robbery in the Crown Court. He brought a complaint to the um, European Court of Human Rights um, that he hadn't been able to participate effectively in his trial because of his youth and his low intellectual ability. That claim was allowed, uh, and the European Court uh, set out a number of points of principle, um, which really um, effectively said that the right of an accused to effective participation in, in his or her trial generally includes not only the right to be present, but of course to hear and to follow proceedings. And then they talked about what a child might need uh, to have in order to make sure that, that happened. And they set out also really what effective participation means, so a broad understanding of the nature of the process, of what is at stake, um, to either with or without the assistance of an interpreter, lawyer, social worker or friend, to understand the general thrust of what's being said in court, um, and um, to, uh, if represented, to be able to explain to his or her lawyers, his or her version of events, point out any statements with which they disagree, uh, and so on. So all points that we're now really, really familiar with. Um, in, um, in family uh, justice uh, system, but that was set out clearly as requirements for effective participation in that case in 2005. In terms of the intermediary's role in the early days and, and as things developed, it's very much the same as, 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 as now, really. And the basic framework set out in the Youth Justice and Criminal Evidence Act, and there's some more detail in the criminal procedure rules. Um, but they, they basically, um, the, the, the rules basically say the primary function of the intermediary is to improve the quality of evidence and understanding between the court, the advocates, and the witness or defendant, and, and, and it adds a bit more sort of detail. Interestingly, in the, sort of the, the, the Red Book equivalent in criminal or Blackstone's criminal practice, there's an assertion that um, experience has shown that one of the most useful functions of intermediaries is to assist the trial judge and counsel in establishing what types of questions are likely to cause misunderstanding um, and thus be averted. Uh, and there's a, a, a sort of leading case um, of 2012, the Court of Appeal, um, dealt with a case called Cox. Uh, and they also noted um, that uh, an intermediary, although an intermediary can help a witness to communicate by explaining questions and answers, um, again, it's, it's suggested um, that that actually happens rarely in practice um, uh, and that um, questions are usually put directly to the witness. Um, the idea being that work is done beforehand to make sure the questions are going to be appropriate uh, and easily understood. So um, in terms of later developments, uh, to, to, to the point where shortly intermediaries were used in, in other areas of the justice system, although um, it's right to say that the criminal um, justice system was the trailblazer in the sense that that's where we first saw intermediaries used, um, it's fair to say that um, that area of law lagged somewhat behind um, other areas now, at least so far as defendants are concerned, um, with real constraints now operating to limit the circumstances in which and the time for which an intermediary is likely to be appointed. Um, one of the cases on this um, is uh, the Crown uh, on the application of OP against the Ministry of Justice. This is a 2014 High Court case. Um, it was uh, involved uh, an applicant with a significant learning dif uh, disability uh, and uh, autistic uh, spectrum condition. Um, the issue for the, in fact, the divisional court, uh, the issue was whether an intermediary was required for the whole trial, uh, as the defendant asserted, uh, or just while he gave his evidence. Um, and that this um, underpinning all of this, as you might imagine, was some funding constraints. Courts being very slow to want to uh, appoint an intermediary for the entirety of the trial, as opposed to the short period for which um, evidence is being given. Uh, and Rafferty, um, Lady Justice Rafferty, identified two distinct needs which might arise in the course of a trial. The first, she said, is founded in general support, reassurance, and calm interpretation of unfolding events. 
The second requires skilled support and interpretation with the potential for intervention and on occasion suggestions to the bench associated with the giving of the defendant's evidence. And she said, perhaps unsurprisingly at first, is a task readily achievable by an adult with experience of life and the cast of mind, at, mind apt to facilitate comprehension by a worried individual on trial. Whereas the second requires developed skills of the type contemplated by inclusion in the witness intermediary scheme. The most pressing need for help of an intermediary self-evidently bites at the point of maximum strain. That is when an accused, should he do so, elects to give an account of himself by entering the witness box and submitting to cross-examination. And ultimately what that case says is that, um, it's, that the court wasn't persuaded that it was essential that a registered intermediary be available to all defendants for the duration of their trials. Um, it, it, the um, safeguards and the other measures available to tribunals would be sufficient to protect their interests um, for uh, all bar that point when they're giving evidence. Uh, and that's in fact, that decision was endorsed by the Law Commission in a report from 2016 called Unfitness to Plead um, and uh, it's subsequently been uh, emphasised in other cases uh, since then. In 2014, there was another case where the, the trial just had to deal with a similar issue as to whether the intermediary was needed for the whole trial or just part of the evidence, uh, and he um, decided that the latter. And he uh, also, in that case, or well, the Court of Appeals, sorry, established on appeal that uh, it should be um, common practice for ground, what are now called ground rules hearings to take place in every single case, whether or not there's an intermediary, and that's thought to be an important way, again, of ensuring fairness. In terms of um, that situation where an intermediary either isn't available for a whole trial or where the trial judge decides that it's not appropriate to appoint one for the whole trial, um, training has been rolled out um, to try to make sure that uh, tribunals and advocates are well equipped to deal with, to make up what one might say is the gap um, between, uh, to, to ensure um, that uh, communication is such that those defendants um, can still follow proceedings even when they have the benefit of a trained intermediary for the entirety. Um, so in 2011, the Advocacy Training Council published its Raising the Bar report, which provided recommendations for training uh, barristers and handling vulnerable witnesses and defendants. And eventually then we've got the Advocates Toolkit, which we're all uh, extremely familiar with. And it's also led to the Advocacy and the Vulnerable training being rolled out. Uh, and in particular the Vulnerable Witness Training course, which uh, was um, made available to all criminal practitioners and is now, of course, being made available to family practitioners as well, which is great news. Um, so in terms of where we are now after those early days of intermediaries, um, it, throughout the criminal justice system, um, the use of intermediaries for vulnerable witnesses is really well established and absolutely commonplace, um, but it's a much bumpier path for, for defendants who may have the need of it. And really, it can be summed up by a few uh, principles, which is that there's no presumption that the defendant will be assisted by an intermediary. And even where an intermediary would improve the trial process, and the judge considers that that's the case, appointment isn't mandatory. And a trial won't be rendered unfair because the direction to appoint an intermediary to the defendant is ineffective, usually because there isn't one um, available, there being uh, something of a shortage. Um, but where a defendant's vulnerable, or for some other reason experiences communication or hearing difficulties such that they need more help than can be provided by their legal team, then the court should consider sympathetically uh, any application for the defendant to be accompanied throughout the trial by a support worker or other appropriate companion who can provide that assistance. So I'm going to hand over now to Gemma, who's going to um, focus on intermediaries in family proceedings. <coughs> So, as you've heard, intermediaries in criminal proceedings um, predated family, family law. We were quite slow, really, in uh, looking at um, that gap. Um, quite a long time, I think, to get it on board. But now, in fact, we seem to have caught up and overtaken, I would say, really what's going on within criminal jurisdiction. Uh, I first remember uh, the use of intermediary being discussed in a case I was in back in 2013. And uh, that was um, before uh, this Justice Hogg, and there were many um, parties and uh, interveners who had learning disabilities and learning difficulties. And at the time, there was a real debate going on, you probably remember, about the funding of uh, intermediaries. Was it the LSC, as it was called then, or was it the court service? Um, and, and as was actually uh, identified, really, by this is Justice Tice in Re-Ex, and I've put the uh, citation there in the notes. 
the, the absence of an intermediary scheme in family cases led to what she called real obstacles. And certainly later on in November 2011, a survey of Ministry of Justice registered intermediaries revealed that one intermediary had four pending referrals to act in family cases, but all four were stuck in funding negotiations. And in the case that I was in, I remember uh, Michael Rimmer from the LSE actually coming to court and being asked about how it was going to be funded and, uh, and agreed on a one-off kind of basis that they would provide funding. In fact, it didn't go ahead. The fact finding didn't go ahead. Um, but there were obviously the, the costs. And I mean, the costs that are ongoing at the moment, because we do use intermediaries so much, I, I wanted to try and find out those costs, but I haven't been able to. Uh, they must be huge um, that the court system is effectively funding that service now. So that was back in um, 2013, my own experience. Let's fast forward a little bit. Who now is um, vulnerable within family proceedings and care proceedings? Well, we do have these um, family procedure rules and practice direction, which I hope that I haven't looked in the uh, handout, but I think they're in there as well. So practice direction 3AA, which supplements um, rule 3A. There isn't really a comprehensive definition of what is vulnerable. There is, within the documents, a, a helpful sort of definition if you've got victims of domestic abuse. So it says subject to paragraph 2, this is 3A, 2A I'm looking at, where it's stated that a party or witness is or is at risk of being a victim of uh, domestic abuse carried out by a party, a relative of another party, or a witness in the proceedings, the court must assume that the following matters are diminished, the quality of the parties or witnesses' evidence in relation to a, third, a party, their participation in the proceedings. Um, they can request for that assumption not to apply. So that's a, a sort of, I, I think I put in my notes that there isn't a, a definition, but there's a sort of helpful steer there in that circumstance. What we do have is now a definition of what an intermediary is, and that's a person whose function is to communicate questions put to a witness or party, communicate to any person asking such questions the answers given by the witness or party in reply to them, and explain such questions or answers so far as is necessary to enable them to be understood by the witness or party or by the person asking such questions. And I pause there because anyone who has used an intermediary, and I've used intermediaries in quite a lot of cases over several years now, um, I think they do a lot more than just that. If you've got a vulnerable client, I think they're, they are um, very good at getting rapport with the client. So, so it's a, a kind of limited definition there, but I would certainly say that they, are, they provide more than that. Um, we know we're, we're very used to using them for parties with learning disability or learning difficulty. They're also used for those with a, a mental health condition which affects their ability to communicate, particularly when they're under pressure or under stress. I, I would say they're being used more now than just in learning disability, and I can see Diane nodding at learning disability and learning difficulties. So it's not just the sort of IQ level that dictates whether you'll get an intermediary. It's a, a wider concept of what makes them vulnerable, and the, the, you know, the, the real need that you're, you're trying to fulfil is that you want them to participate, you want their Article 6 rights to be protected. And I think within family, having heard Alison's talk about crime, I think we are definitely opening up um, the use of intermediaries, whereas originally it was very much with learning disability. Um, I've gone on to, within my handout, to also talk about their use within assisting in terms of uh, children giving evidence, and I know that having spoken to Diane, this is a kind of training that Triangle offer, it's a separate sort of training that intermediaries do. But um, prior to the Supreme Court's decision in Reed W, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, given the citation there, there was a presumption really against children being called as witnesses in care proceedings. In LM and Medway, uh, Lady Justice Smith said that children giving evidence in care proceedings would be rare. Now, that was back in 2007. I was, in fact, one of the counsel representing that child. And in fact, in that case, she did give evidence. She gave evidence by video link. Um, it really it didn't distress her, actually. It didn't really add anything, to be honest, to the case. But it was very unusual. There was no guidance. There was no help. There were no services. It was, it was really cobbling together um, the mechanism for that to, to happen. Um, but even now, sort of 15 years later, there hasn't really been a real shift. We don't have children giving evidence that often. And what you may well be familiar with is um, one advocate or the advocates putting together one lot of questions. 
and an intermediary will ask those questions of the child. It will be videoed and effectively that will be played. Now I've had experience of that. It's very effective. Um, it, you do, do you take the time to do the questions? The judge looked at the questions. And then again, it was in fact um, one of Diane's colleagues from um, Triangle who undertook that exercise. Um, you have to do the you know, rapport building. It's a very skilled exercise, but it was a very useful way to get the evidence um, before the court of this child actually in some way being cross-examined. They're also involved intermediaries with supporting children who are being ABE interviewed. And I've set out there at paragraph 8 the case of ET, where in fact the advice of the uh, intermediary was not followed. That was criticised because they, the interviewer was you know, really asking too many questions of the, the child. So the key point really is that this, the, your vulnerable party must be able to fully take part in the proceedings. Um, and it's not only a matter for those who are representing um, the mother or father in care proceedings, it's also a duty really upon the local authority and they have to fill out in their social work template that they have um, treated the parents fairly and that there has been a procedure that's been fair. And I've set out at paragraph 10 there another case, quite a recent case, A and B children deaf parent assessment of practice, um, where in fact the issue of the local authority ensuring that they explicitly identified how they fulfilled the requirement to communicate adequately with deaf parent was considered. Um, and as was observed in that case, the duty for social workers and local authorities to consider and implement procedural fairness is not just a box to be ticked at the end of the sweat. Um, it represents sworn evidence of how the local authority has fulfilled its duty to guarantee a parent's Article 6 rights to a fair trial throughout its involvement. And they referred to um, Riel, uh, Mr Justice Mumby, as he then was, I'm sure you're familiar with this, but it's the state in the form of the local authority assumes a heavy burden when it seeks to take a child into care. Part of that burden is the need in the interest not merely of the parent but also of the child for a transparent and transparently fair procedure at all stages of the process, by which I mean the process both in and out of court. So if we turn now to a bit more sort of practical issues, firstly, what you really do need is a cognitive assessment. So you may have, a, and, and you really ought to have a cognitive assessment pre-proceedings if the local authority get involved. Cognitive assessments are key. They will inform how the local authority undertake assessments. It doesn't always happen. But, but that document is really important. Obviously, it sets out whether there are any uh, learning needs, whether what the IQ is, and other sort of aspects of how somebody is functioning. And on the back of that, you may well be uh, considering applying for an intermediary. So I would say if you've got any learning difficulty, if you've got a mental health issue that impacts on the ability to understand or communicate, they are under 18 and they're not, they're not a litigation friend and you're, you're concerned about whether they're understanding what's going on, you really need to look at this. It's, it's got to be done. I think at the early stages. If, if you don't do it at the early stages and you're doing it later on down the line, we'll look at the most recent court of appeal case, then effectively, you know, your, your, your whole hearing is, is, is not going anywhere. Um, then, obviously, you can apply on the back of that from the intermediary. I've had cases recently, and I don't know whether it's others' experience, where in effect, everyone said, well, they're going to need an intermediary. Let's just cut straight to the assessment of community court or triangle. Let's just cut out the, uh, any psychological assessment or cognitive assessment. And of course, it's worth noting that intermediary services, and I've spoken to Diane earlier today, they do not accept that a client needs an intermediary on the basis of a report from a psychologist or other expert. They do their own assessments in any event. So the application in theory is made by part 25. Um, again, I've had cases where in effect the court just uh, grants the application and then you have your assessment Either you can have it at court, perhaps your client and the intermediary attend court and then everyone else comes at 2pm and there's a sort of oral feedback in a, in a ground rules hearing about whether there's a need for an intermediary. Generally, recommendations will include how often the client will need a break. Really important. And really important if you're representing somebody in you know, long care proceedings, serious allegations, that particularly with judges having the need to really, you know, I've got however many days to deal with this, so I'm going to get through it all, that you, you stand up, and I'm sure most, uh, most intermediates will do it as well anyway, but you make sure you're on top of the, right, is it a break every hour? You have a break. Because there's got to be a time 
or when they are doing nothing at all, and then they have to have the time when they talk to the intermediary, and perhaps you as well, and you're going through with the intermediary what's happened. So you've got to factor that in. Um, what sort of language to use, whether questions need to be submitted in advance of the hearing to the intermediaries only for vetting. The most unpopular recommendation I think that ever, ever comes out for me as an intermediary. How many people ever do that <laughs> without complaining or try and resist it? Um, and again, that's really important. I've had a case where um, you know, an advocate didn't submit their questions. And in the middle of my client giving evidence, I'm finding myself sort of complaining and the intermediary is complaining. And the whole, the whole sort of her evidence is just broken up with people saying, no, 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 sorry, could you rephrase that? Sorry, what did you, can we just break that down? There's three questions in one there. And I think some advocates find that really difficult because it's really against the grain of our training. Our training is that, you know, we go in with this wonderful cross-examination with our very clever points that we want to make. And we don't like to sort of give it away. And we don't like somebody simplifying it. But it, it is a really important exercise. You do feel like you're at school. You give your questions in. You get them back with a few comments and things like that. Um, but again, a, a really key thing that needs to be adhered to. Uh, and then, of course, any other um, special measures that might be necessary. Now, intermediaries are neither expert witnesses nor witness supporter. And in fact, you'll find in any of the um, intermediary assessments, they will say this is not an, an expert assessment. They provide communication guidance, sit alongside the witness in order to monitor communication and intervene to assist with communication matters. They're basically there to assist the family judge to hear the voice of the child or the vulnerable party or the witness. The, we used to have, and we still do, I think there's still different ways of, of being interrupted. We used to have a traffic light system in some of the courts I went to where, where the intermediary would put up a trap, one of the colours. Um, generally, I think intermediaries are very good at just standing up and saying, uh, uh, putting their hand up, or it's quite good at the beginning of a hearing, and I think most judges will do it, to agree a method of how um, things are going to be stopped by the intermediary if necessary. Now, I've highlighted at paragraph 15 that Professor Penny Cooper, she's been particularly instrumental in writing on this subject and highlighting the need for assistance for vulnerable parties. And as Alison's already mentioned the toolkit, she was also very instrumental in that. And I'm sure you're all very familiar with looking at the different guidance that's in there. And we also, also have this now training for vulnerable witnesses. So we are really sort of moving on a pace within a decade. So let's have a look at the up-to-date case law, really. Um, it has come to prominence in recent years, and some really sort of interesting case law, I think. So the first one that I've cited there at paragraph 17 is RES, Vulnerable Parent Intermediary 2020. There was a full psychological assessment undertaken, made several recommendations about how best to communicate with the mother. So by using her own vocabulary, using no more than 20 words in question, avoiding leading questions, it's always very difficult, taking breaks every 20 minutes. The psychologist subsequently agreed in answer to a specific question from the mother's representatives that she would benefit from and require the assistance of an intermediary at the IRH. And of course, on the back of that, an application was issued. The judge at first instance refused the mother's application on the basis that it was neither proportionate nor necessary when her communication difficulties will be adequately addressed by the adoption of the practical recommendations made by the psychologist. And given they were quite um, clear recommendations and, and quite sort of particular recommendations, one would think that that's possibly not unreasonable. The judge made participation directions giving effect to these recommendations and listed the matter to consider the arrangements for the hybrid final hearing. It was envisaged that the mother and her representatives would attend court and some or or all of the other advocates and witnesses would attend remotely. When those representing the mother sought clarification of the impact of the format of the hearing upon the mother's needs and intermediary support, the judge stated that reconsideration of a decision was not required. But the Court of Appeal allowed the mother's appeal, ordering the intermediary assessment, and subject to any different order made at pre-trial review, ordering the intermediary to attend the final hearing. And they noted that the judge had carefully directed herself to the legal framework provided by Part 3A and uh, Practice Direction 3AA, Family Procedure Rules, and she was entitled to depart from the opinion of the expert, since it did not relate to a matter which was distinctively within his ex uh, specialist expertise. However, she had failed to give consideration to a specific effect of the hybrid nature of the hearing on the mother's ability, in view of her cognitive difficulties, to participate effectively in it. In particular, she had overlooked the fact that the process would remove many of the visual cues 
that are so valuable to individuals with a cognitive impairment and that an intermediary could provide the mother with communication support as regards the unusual experience of being questioned by advocates whose faces appear on the screen. And, and I think that's a really valid point, and we probably all kind of um, experienced this during lockdown, is that we, we came to, to understand how a lot of our communication isn't just um, over devices, that we miss the other cues that we get. And I think coming back to court, and I know I, I've been at court for some time now, since October so fully, you really appreciate when you're acting for somebody, particularly a vulnerable party, their party how you can um, read their body language, understand them more, how, how they're reacting to what's going on, um, which you cannot see on the screen. Um, so in any event, this judge had overlooked that fact. And um, eventually she was, she was wrong to refuse the applications and should have at least deferred the decision about the intermediary's attendance at the final hearing until she had seen the assessment report. And Lord Justice Jackson emphasised that the decision in this case was not to be interpreted as requiring intermediaries in all remote or hybrid hearings where there is a party or witness with a similar cognitive profile to the mother, which is a case-specific decision which has been reached by considering the particular circumstances of the case. And then I finally have, have uh, put in the handout at paragraph 20, a very recent case, um, you, you can actually see it on the uh, Court of Appeal YouTube uh, if you want to if you want to watch it. Um, S Vulnerable Party Fairness of Proceedings. And in, in this case, which is really interesting, the, the actual issue didn't even really arise until they'd already got permission to appeal. So, so effectively, the failure to appoint an intermediary to assist a vulnerable party led to the appeal being granted. But um, the original permission to appeal application did not mention any issue about the lack of an intermediary and breach of Article 6. What had happened, it was an intervener called A. The local authority, in fact, issued proceedings on um, her children. The, the uh, reports that were done in those proceedings had led to this question mark over her uh, ability to understand what was going on and when she needed an intermediary. She had um, been assessed um, by a forensic psychologist, psychologist who said that she may be assisted by an intermediary, and then she had an appointment with Communicorp for assessment that was due to take place. And so the Court of Appeal was shown two reports, the first by Dr Gary Taylor and Lucy Howe, which stated, we are not recommending any special measures to enable A to participate in the hearing, although she is likely to take benefit from there being regular breaks in the proceedings so that information can be explained to her in words she can understand. Important information pertaining to proceedings may need to be explained to her more than once. It goes on to say how professionals should deal with her. And there was a second report by Dr. Josling, a consultant clinical and forensic psychologist, and that said the following, A's cognitive function assessment showed that she is better at perceptual reasoning than verbal reasoning. She prefers written and verbal information to be presented in clearer formats, extra time given her to assimilate material. Um, her full comprehension of what she may be reading may need further support and time and would not necessarily be immediate. I ensured that I gave a adequate time on all of her assessments to enable her to do so. And she goes on to question whether there should be um, an assessment for dyslexia. She had a full-scale IQ score of 88, so low average. So she didn't have a learning disability or uh, a learning difficulty, really, apart from the other issues that have been identified, but certainly not a learning disability. Um, and then A had attended this assessment with Communicourt on the day before the appeal hearing. A community court indicated in an email, I am recommending an intermediary for A, as she has difficulties with processing long sentences, under understanding court-specific terminology, understanding and responding to complex grammatical structures, understanding complex vocabulary, processing simple information, remembering key dates, and often gets the details confused. And the a had findings against her in this case, it was not accident injury. So the appeal was then opposed by the local authority and the mother. And if you watch the hearing, there is a lot of sort of dissection, I think, about, you know, well, she said this here in the transcript, she seemed to understand it. And, you know, I suppose putting it in the simple terms, querying whether that was really correct, in other words. Um, the Court of Appeal recognised that in recent years, courts have recognised the need to make due provision for vulnerable persons to participate in proceedings. And they referred again to the rules in Part 3A, the Planned Procedure Rules, and a similarly the Practice Direction 3AA. They confirm there's no definition of vulnerability in the rules, but provisions plainly extend to persons with comprehension difficulties of the sort identified by Dr. Josling in her assessment of A. 
and they reminded the parties that it was good practice for all parties' representatives to actively address the question of whether a party is vulnerable at the outset of the proceedings, um, and that the issue should even be identified by social workers' pre-proceedings. They referred to the case of Rien and the words of Lady Justice King, Part 3A and its accompanying practice, practice direction provide a specific structure designed to give effective access to the court and to ensure a fair trial for those people who fall into the category of vulnerable witnesses. A wholesale failure to apply Part 3 procedure to a vulnerable witness must, in my mind, make it highly likely the resulting trial will be judged to have been unfair. Now, the Court of Appeal made it clear that it would not always lead to an appeal. The question on appeal in each case would be first whether there has been a serious procedural or other irregularity, and secondly, if so, whether as a result the decision was unjust. And they observed in this case that legal representatives should be particularly vigilant to detect possible vulnerabilities in their clients when they are unable to meet them in person. So this hearing had been remote. So again, it goes back to the point that if you're not seeing your client and not able to sort of have that kind of interaction, you may be missing really key things. They noted that the need for an intermediary was not identified in the initial cognitive assessment carried out by Dr. Taylor and Ms. Howe, and that the extent of A's difficulties only became apparent in the subsequent assessments carried out by Dr. Josling and Community Court. But they, they reached the clear, clear conclusion that the failure in this case to identify A's cognitive difficulties and to make appropriate participation directions to ensure the quality of evidence was not diminished as a result of vulnerability amounted to a serious procedural irregularity and that as a result the outcome of the hearing was unjust and the appeal was allowed. Um, my sort of observation on that as well is they, they clearly rely on the community court report to some extent. So the idea of community court report not being an expert report is, is perhaps difficult to marry up in some ways. Although they obviously had to report as well of um, Dr. Josling. So I think in the last 10 years, certainly from my knowledge since 2013, we've really come um, a long way in terms of using intermediaries. And I know that certain judges find them uh, very difficult. Um, some of them don't like using them. At first, they kind of sort of think there's one really needed. And then often by the end of it, they're very grateful. Um, and I'm extremely grateful for the assistance that intermediaries have given me. And I've done two long cases with Diane, and it's been absolutely valuable. And I also reflect back on older cases, and I do wonder whether, you know, had there been an intermediary, the outcomes might have been different in some ways. So I think they're incredibly important. I think everybody really needs to think about it as soon as possible, if you're representing particularly a parent, um, at the earliest opportunity, because um, you don't want to be in the middle of a final hearing when your client is giving evidence, and you suddenly have that light bulb moment thinking, I actually don't think he or she understands what's being put to them in any way, shape or form. And by then, you know, you've lost all of that opportunity to get everything sorted out. So now I am going to hand over to Diane. And that's the right one, isn't it? Yes, yeah. Who is going to talk to you about her work at Triangle. Hi, everyone. Um, I was going to give a little introduction about Triangle and a little bit of how I became an intermediary because I've not always been an intermediary. Um, I spent 25 years as a, a hotel manager and about 11 years ago um, my youngest went to nursery and as much as I loved my job in, in, the, in catering I thought if I don't change now I will be doing weddings and funerals when I retire. So I took the decision to go back to college because my qualifications were so old they were almost null and void. Um, so I went back to college and I did an access course, I actually did two, to get the required UCAS points to go on to, to university. I then went to university while still working and did a degree and then a master's in forensic psychology. When I was in my last year of my undergrad, one of my lecturers, she was also a registered intermediary with the Witness Intermediary Scheme. And she approached me and said, oh, I think you'd be really good at this. And I said, no, I don't think you will. <laughs> so um, I, I didn't go to that round of recruitment with Triangle. 
And then when they recruited the following year, she didn't really give me a choice. She put my name down and made me go to the interview, and here I am. <laughs> so, and I can honestly say I've never looked back. I thoroughly enjoy my job. It's it's a learning curve every day. You know, it's um, you you think you're going to court or into doing assessment, and you've got a bit of a picture on somebody, and that could just you know all turn on its head on, in the blink of an eye. So a little bit of background about that's about me. So a little bit of background about Triangle, if I can just, yeah. So Triangle work uh, is an independent organisation, and we work with young vulnerable people up to the age of thirty now, um, and we we help them to communicate about per important things to them, but more specifically, the intermediate roles, especially in, in legal proceedings. I do family cases and criminal cases, and although the job is initially the same, the roles are quite different um, in the criminal courts and in the family courts, and it's a very different. <coughs> I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, in the last 20 years, actually, it's almost 25 now, um, Triangle have worked with over 10,000 children and young people across the UK through not only intermediary services, but through advocacy, consultancy, expert interviewing and expert opinion services. Because of the nature of the work that Triangle does, it's essentially about building relationships quickly with children and young vulnerable adults. And this is generally quite often in a stressful and traumatic situation for them. And it enables them to explain important things. As a result of working with very young children, and vulnerable adults with complex needs. We've often come, not me personally, but we've often come across um, situations or difficulties that have not been encountered previously by the police or by the courts. So therefore it's been possible for Triangle to quietly do things different and we've had many opportunities to innovate and try things out for the first time, certainly in England. So a couple of examples. So as far back as 2000, let me just get my torch for right. <laughs> in 2011, sorry, 2007, the first planned use, the intermediary suggested first planned use of non-adjourned breaks at a trial. In 2011, it was the first time that counsel were brought into the live link room to conduct a cross-examination. Also in 2011, a first, the first three-year-old was called to trial. In 2012, um, there was the first use of a den in the live link room for an extremely traumatised child at, at trial. So she was assessed, this young girl was assessed by um, an intermediary, a registered intermediary, who was actually my supervisor. And the only way that Michelle could get her to talk is if she was in this den so that nobody could see her. So this was what Michelle recommended in her report and it was it was passed by the judge. Uh, in 2014, um, Ruth Marchant, the late great Ruth Marchant, who founded Triangle, she supported the youngest ever witness to a murder case and that four-year-old um, was this little child was four years old at the time of trial when she gave her evidence. In 2015, a triangle intermediary, um, it was the first time that barristers wore casual clothes for cross-examination in court, so not just the no wigs and gowns, it was Spider-Man t-shirts and all that kind of thing, just so that um, this, this child could, you know, could feel at ease. Um, in 2016, it was the first use of an intermediary with a child in the Republic of Ireland. Now, in 2017, I worked with a prosecution witness in the Republic of Ireland, and they had no real experience or understanding of the role. They were very suspicious. I wasn't allowed to talk to anybody. I had to stay in my own little room. Um, but we got there. <laughs> Eventually, we got there in the end. And the last one, Triangles First, is in 2016, this was the same intermediary with the den. Um, she recommended that the little girl give her evidence on a rocking chair, on a rocking horse, sorry, pardon, in the live link room. Um, again, that was um, approved by the judge. And she was able to give good, complete, coherent evidence, which is what we're, what we're after. I'm going to come back to that. So, 
An intermediary put very simply facilitates communication between a witness, defendant or party and others in the justice process. So that's solicitors, counsel, the judge, anybody. An intermediary put not so simply facilitates two-way communication between a witness, a prosecution witness or a defence witness or the defendant as a witness or a party or a defendant throughout the trial or hearing and others in the justice process which include the police, legal teams, witness services and or the court. So if you pop on the Triangle's website that shows you all about what we do but we have two two sections to the website. So we have the Tell Me Like I'm 14. So this gives a little bit more of a, we help young people explain things to the police, we'll get to know you talk about court. But then we also have Tell Me Like I'm 4. Um, so we will do playing and drawing with you, get to know you, and we'll help you talk to other people like the police. And if you have to go to court, we'll come and do your job. And one thing that we all do before we even attempt to sort of do an assessment, whether it was a child or a young vulnerable person, is that we need as much background information on that person as possible. I went to do um, an assessment with a little boy, I think he was six years old, um, and he was on the autistic spectrum, and I ran his mom and we had a good chat, and she went, she went, I'm really, hope, I, should, I think I'm wasting your time, he's not going to talk to you, he doesn't talk to anybody. And I said, right, tell me, what does he like? What does he like to do? What's he into? And she said, he loves Spider-Man. So I get my son's Spider-Man bag thing. Um, I had a Spider-Man hat. I had some like Spider-Man crayons and pens and pencils. And I went in and I just sat them on the table and I talked to his mum and he, and he just got in and he was in my bag and he was playing with all the things. And, you know, it took a long time, but I was able to do the assessment. And, you know, his mum said to me that, you know, nobody who's ever come to speak to him before has ever put as much effort into what does he need, you know, what works for him. And that's what this is communication, you know, that's what it's all about. So that was um, one of my success stories. So, why are we here? <laughs> Um, so the use of interviews in family court, it's the same basic procedures in the criminal court. As Gemma said, um, they, it's much easier for these days to, to get an intermediary in the family court as compared to the criminal court. But we meet with a vulnerable person and we assess their communication needs. That's what we do. I am not um, a psychologist. I am not a psychiatrist. That's way above my pay grade. I am there to look at how people, how that young person can communicate to the best of their ability. What special measures do we need to be thinking about? What tricks do we need to be putting into the, the hearing process or the trial process um, to, to allow for effective communication? So after every assessment, there's a report. Um, and their recommendations on how best to facilitate the communication. Um, the intermediary also attends a ground rules hearing to discuss and agree the approach. As Gemma touched on, and I'll touch on again in a minute, um, can check advocates plan questions in advance of cross-examination and facilitates communication, communication sorry, with the vulnerable person throughout proceedings and during the intermediate process is quite different for family and criminal work, but every case starts the same with, the, 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 with an assessment. It's not just an assessment of the receptive and expressive communication, so that's how somebody understands information and how somebody explains themselves. But we also look at how we make need to meet might need to manage um, emotional state in court, Gemma touched briefly on mental health issues. Um, assessments are usually carried out at the solicitor's office, although during the pandemic we've all, as we all know, we've had to adapt um, the way that we've done this. So we've had to do, um, we've done it on WhatsApp, done it on FaceTime, and it's beneficial in one way because it allows 
an intermediary to see if that person has access to that kind of technology, whether they're able to use it or not. It, so it, it should be required to access a hearing in the future that way. But touching again, <coughs> sorry, on what General was saying, is that it, there is a barrier, that there's an, already a barrier to communication there with the video platform. Um, and you can't see all those people don't always want to look at the camera, so the camera would be down and all I would see was their feet or their dog. Um, so then the, the cues that I look for, whether somebody uses their hands like me <laughs> to express or whether their facial expressions, that a lot of that was lost. So the, 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 it was tricky, shall we say. Um, again, Gemma touched basically on this. Sometimes assessments are, you know, are pulled in at the last minute for whatever reason, um, and we would do an assessment maybe on the morning and give verbal recommendations to the court, um, possibly in the afternoon. We would usually be provided, on accepting the case, we would usually be provided with some background information, but this varies quite drastically sometimes. It goes back to the point I made earlier on. The bigger picture we have of this young person, the easier it is for us to um, adapt the assessment to their needs and, and that sort of thing. Um, we'll write the report, set out the recommendations. This will include, like Gemma said, the need for breaks, the type and the length of questions, things to be avoided. We'll take into account any medical diagnosis and if that young person is taking any medication that might affect their ability to concentrate or to attend for long periods of time. I think I've missed one there. Okay, <laughs> not let me go back. So each, this is quite an important point, I think. When I um, explained to my colleagues that I was coming here today to, to talk to you, I reached out for you know their comments and what they would like sort of uh, to be mentioned. Uh, and one thing came came across quite strongly is that each intermediate each intermediate report is person centred, so it's based on that person on that on that day. What's often quite difficult is it can often be a snapshot of that person on that day, and that is what that report is is written on, with the help of maybe psychologists or psych uh, psychiatric reports as well. Um, although all intermediaries complete an index training and development program, we have continuing professional development, we have regular supervision, both peer supervision and um, managerial supervision, but we're all individual practitioners um, and we because I do something one way with one client, it doesn't necessarily mean that that particular method of working is necessarily going to work with another client. It's really important that it's my job to adapt my way of working to each individual person. And what works with one person doesn't always work with another. But more importantly at that point, I think, is what works with one person on Monday might not necessarily work with that person on Tuesday. So then I have to go back to the thing, but the thing, right, okay, how you know how do we manage this? So what works well? Working as an intermediate in the family courts is very different from working in the criminal courts and as a result it requires a different skill set. Now this is feedback from one of my colleagues and she she said that there could be merit in having dedicated only family intermediaries. Um, I can see a point, yeah, I can see a point. For me, I enjoy the, the variety. I find the criminal, I find the, the family things can be quite tough, sort of emotionally, that they stay with me a little bit longer. So quite often I like to go back to a criminal case where it's, I can walk away much easier at the end of the day. Um, because of the length of these cases, it's really important to try and ensure continuity of an intermediate where possible as the vulnerable person has often already experienced changes in social workers, support workers, counsel. Unfortunately, this it doesn't happen and it's not it's not something that, that we can even guarantee anymore. The the number of cases that, that come in to Triangle, there's bound to be some, some overlap and when hearings are listed quite last minute and if I'm on a trial, 
it suffered as I am for now, which is listed for three months. So I've had to hand over some quite short hearings for ongoing family cases because I just can't physically be there. I mean, luckily the judge let me finish at lunchtime, so if you come down here today. So rapport is the biggest part of my job. If I, don't, if I can't build and establish rapport with a vulnerable person, I've had it from, from the start. Um, these are likely to be lengthy proceedings. In some cases, there is a finding of fact hearing. They can be quite lengthy, and then you move on then to a final hearing with regards to welfare. So it, the rapport is, is key. It's key to this whole, whole relationship. And I think it's important to ask, it's important to ask that assessment whether that person feels they'd be able to work with you. Now, this is not something that we used to do, but Triangle as well as Communicorp were recently awarded the contract for the court-appointed intermediary scheme brought by the Ministry of Justice. And this was something that the Ministry of Justice looked at our reports and at Communicorp's reports and said, well, you're just assuming that these people want to work with you. You know, you need to be giving them the option to say, well, actually, do you know what, I don't, I don't feel it. You know, maybe I'd be, I'd be better with somebody else. So this is something that we've been doing. And so far, nobody said no. So, um, communication is also key, and that's not just between the intermediary and the client, but it's everybody: counsel, social workers, um, solicitors. And I think if we have to take over a case that's not ours or we're not familiar with, there needs to be times built into that court day, whether it's for a short couple of hours to a uh, two-hour um, IRH hearing, I need to be able to build some level of rapport with that person. Um, the, and it should, it's important that um, the intermediate has good rapport with counsel as well, because vulnerable clients need to see a positive relationship, and that gives them some confidence. <coughs> Um, I mean, and this could vary a lot, and this was some of the feedback that came back from, from some of my intermediate colleagues, that the amount of sort of communication can vary a lot from, um, from case to case to being kept absolutely fully informed of what's going on and to what one poor colleague of mine said to be pretty much ignored for the, for the full uh, five-day final hearing. So. I just want to touch on, on COVID because obviously, like yourselves, we've all we've had to adapt our um, adapt our practice. Remote hearings. There was a lot of feedback about this. In some cases, not many. It can be beneficial to a younger person if it's a very short hearing. There's nothing contested. That you know we're only going to be there a couple of hours. Then maybe you know that's beneficial. What really needs to happen though, in all remote hearings. The intermediary needs to be with the person. They can be from the solicitor's office, from the local authority's office, from council's chambers, but they need, the intermediary needs to be with the person. Um, the access to technology, as we all know, at the start of, of lockdown was a regular um, issue. Um, and at times, with regards to vulnerable people, there were assumptions made about their ability to access this kind of technology. They were able to, you know, their proficiency to use it, um, and th that caused a lot of a lot of issues. So, like I said, short hearings where issues are clearly defined um, and intermediaries already met the client can be okay. And again, sorry, I've got ahead of myself there. Um, One of my colleagues, um, she, one of her points was hearings where the vulnerable person and the intermediary in separate location undermines our values. And this was a point she made, but this was also made by a judge at Canterbury very, very recently, where the client was at home, the intermediary was at home, and he, the, the judge said, you know, what is the point? You know, there's no, there's no roots of communication there. Um, and like I've touched on before, a large percentage of the communication is non-viable, so it's really important that we be able to physically see the clients. Um, 
Another of my colleagues, as she, one of her points was that she's had a finding of fact hearing that's been done remotely from, from the solicitor's office, including the client giving evidence, being cross-examined, and now that the final hearing is coming up, the court are asking that everybody attend in person, and this vulnerable, um, I think it's a mother, she just can't understand why that's not why that's not why this court has said that that's not possible when she's been through a lengthy uh, finding of fact hearing. So what could be improved? Grand jury hearings. <laughs> they should always include intermediary when there's been an intermediary report. There should always be a, a grand jury hearing. It doesn't happen as often as it should. Um, what often happens is that um, the, the, the report will be looked at and unless it's anything really controversial in the recommendations, it'll be, yeah, that's all fine, that's all great. But however, when it does become an issue is if a ground rule is broken or when inter an intervention is required. And then it can be seen sometimes that as an intermediary, I'm just being a bit difficult. That's not what I'm there for. So I think also there needs to be a flexible approach to the ground rules and I think, like I said before, about this being a, the assessment being a snapshot, um, I make recommendations on that basis, but it may be, especially on a lengthy um, hearing, that something occurs that I haven't seen coming, that nobody's seen coming, that it might be necessary to go back to can we discuss this? Can we look at this? Is there a way around that we can sort this? Uh, so yes, yeah, so we may need to um, revisit them at times. This comes back to um, continuity. A lot of the, the feedback that I got from, from my colleagues, um, it would be helpful, um, and especially lately, this, been a few cases I've worked on where the court has asked that the same team are back um, at future hearings, but we are always kind of bottom of the pecking order when it's asked about availability. So um, that would be really most helpful if that could be considered um, when future court dates are being set. Um, Jim has touched on the, the reviewing of questions. Again, this doesn't always happen and it's not always in order to happen. Um, all that we would say is that if you are allowing us to review your questions is that you bear the, the recommendations about that. There's a whole table in each intermediary, intermediary report about the best way to phrase questions and ask questions. And finally, <laughs> my final point is please can we have some adequate notice to review questions. Uh, not so long ago, I got an email at 10 to 7 in the evening for a cross-examination the following day with 500 plus questions on it. Yeah. Uh, this was despite it being um, mentioned several times in court, you know, have, have you all sent questions to the major? And I was like, no. But there you go, I did it. <laughs> So uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you.